On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Elon Musk hands over control of Starship and Starbase, how NASA technicians and engineers saved the Artemis 1 launch, and Japan re-ups their pledge to help build the Lunar Gateway Station. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. A changing of the guard is happening at Starbase, as reports are confirming that SpaceX COO Gwyn Shotwell has been given control of the Starship program and the Starbase testing facility in Boca Chica, Texas. On November 10th, the information reported that two sources confirmed a high-level reorganization at SpaceX, with the current CEO, Gwyn Shotwell, set to take operational control of the site from CEO Elon Musk in the wake of his acquisition of Twitter. Gwyn's been a large part of the success of SpaceX almost since she arrived at the company in 2002. Back then, she was hired as a business development professional, as her previous work had been to do exactly the same thing at a smaller aerospace operation called Microcosm Inc. But her big break came in 2008 when she headed the negotiations that convinced NASA to finally take a $1.6 billion chance on SpaceX and its newly proven Dragon Capsule and Falcon 9 rocket. Shotwell's leadership on that deal earned SpaceX its first commercial resupply services contract to the International Space Station and landed her with the presidency of SpaceX. Since then, she's managed the company's efforts to build a gigantic operations manifest, taking on contract after contract and making SpaceX a lot of money. Finally, in 2019, Shotwell was invited onto the executive board of directors as the COO, or chief operations officer. This position varies from company to company, but generally, the COO is responsible for running day-to-day -day activities and reporting to the CEO, which would be Elon Musk. So, if the CEO sets the goals and tone of a company and acts as a sort of ambassador, the COO makes sure everything runs according to that plan, and keeps the CEO informed about what's going on. It wouldn't be wrong to see Gwyn Shotwell as the person who has been keeping SpaceX operational this entire time. Elon has even commented before that he spends about 80% of his time on engineering and design, with Shotwell handling the business activities like legal, finance, and sales. The real question is, why she's been asked to take oversight of the whole Starship program, or rather, why now? It's no secret that Elon is currently very busy with the mess over at Twitter HQ, so that could certainly be a reason. Musk has said repeatedly that Twitter is in very bad shape, and he's going to need to spend a lot of time on the company to get it where he wants it. But that's not the only reason Shotwell could have been asked to take over. It seems like the facilities at Boca Chica, more specifically the launch pad, have been taking quite the beating over the past year. The site is a little claustrophobic, with refueling tanks, cranes, and additional testing platforms clustering relatively close together. This means that every time an engine test happens, the surrounding area gets a little more banged up. Elon may have taken more of a supervisory role in the designing of SpaceX tech in the last year or so, with Vice President of Vehicle Engineering Mark Juncosa taking over management of technical teams this summer. But he has ostensibly been in charge of the testing at Boca Chica this whole time, and his move fast and break things style is definitely seen in a lot of the testing that goes on there. Some of you might remember the minor explosion on the pad in July this year, when a spin prime test accidentally ignited some methane exhaust and damaged the booster, the launch equipment, and some other nearby equipment. During engine tests of the Starship prototype S24 in September, bits of superheated material were blown into the nearby area and started a large bush fire. And the most recent 14-engine static fire test of Super Heavy Booster 7 kicked up dust and heated debris over a wide area despite the recent safety upgrades to the pad, like the deluge system and the extra flame guards. But now that we're closing in on finalizing the Starship and Super Heavy designs, it's possible that SpaceX is looking for a more stable hand at the wheel. 
Shotwell may not be an aerospace engineer, but Musk and the company as a whole have relied on her steady and methodical approach to leadership since she won the presidency in 2008. Her ability to translate Elon's wild ideas into more feasible business plans has been noted more than once in her time at SpaceX. So it stands to reason that she would be the person to ask about getting Starbase more organized. So while no official explanation has been given for the reshuffle, it's definitely a good sign that Shotwell is taking the reins. Putting the CEO in charge of a project is a signal that SpaceX is just about done with experimenting and preparing to add Starship operations to the more regular pace of life in the company. Not to mention Gwyn's attention has historically coincided with game-changing deals and the smooth completion of projects. If anyone has the ability to get Starship across the finish line, it's shot well. NASA's Artemis moon missions finally kicked off in earnest on November 16th as the Artemis 1 SLS rocket made a successful liftoff from Pad 39B at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And while we were all celebrating a successful launch and flight to the moon, we should take some time to highlight the efforts of technicians and engineers working behind the scenes to make it all happen. And they were definitely put to the test that night, as Artemis 1's tendency to attract problems almost caused a scrub more than once. The first issue that cropped up was one we had all been expecting, the SLS sprung a leak. The SLS rocket is made up of older shuttle program parts and runs off of liquid hydrogen fuel, just like the shuttles did. This fuel is efficient and clean, only releasing water vapor when burned, but it's also a pain to work with. Liquid hydrogen has to be kept at a cryogenic temperature so cold that metal fittings will change shape on contact with the fuel and the tiny hydrogen molecule is notorious for finding gaps to leak from. Almost all of the major problems with SLS this year have been because of hydrogen leaks. So, like we said, everyone was unsurprised when a leak was discovered during the tanking process. The launch team had decided on a slow-paced fill time in the hopes of letting the vehicle acclimate to the cold, resulting in about a 9-hour fill routine rather than the 7-hour program that was attempted previously. To be fair, for a while the slow fill looked like it was working, but just after they began filling the upper stage a leak was discovered and the flow had to be paused while they figured out a solution. That solution came in the form of the Red Crew. Red crews are teams of repair technicians that have the training to be cleared for work around rockets that are on the pad and at least partially fueled. After some time to make a plan, technicians Trent Annis, Billy Cairns, and safety supervisor Chad Garrett were shuffled over to the launch pad and climbed up to the deck in order to tighten the packing nuts that NASA suspected were the source of the leak. These fasteners helped form the seal around the replenishment valve that had been leaking, and while new SLS procedures ensured the techs paid special attention to bolts just like these all over the rocket, the immense cold of the cryogenic fuel had still forced them out of working order. So, the three Red Crew members made their way under the shadow of the 322 foot tall, mostly fueled SLS, a vehicle that is taller than the Statue of Liberty and full of immensely volatile rocket fuel. Annis described what it was like on the launch platform during an interview just after they returned from repairs, describing their focus on the job. I'd say we were very focused on what was happening up there because the rocket is, you know, it's alive. It's creaking, it's making venting noises. It's pretty scary. But as hair-raising as that situation was, the Red Crew techs were in and out in under an hour, and there weren't any tanking issues after that. Those guys likely won't have to buy their own drinks at the local bar for a while. The last issue presented itself while the Red Crew was speeding away from the site. The Eastern Range Tracking Station is one of the radar stations that tracks rockets lifting off from NASA pads, and it was reporting a loss of signal, something that could warrant a scrub if not fixed fast. It must have felt like a gut punch to the launch team after the success of Red Crew's repairs, a technician was dispatched and quickly found the problem, a faulty Ethernet switch. The relatively simple repair took about 70 minutes to replace the faulty switch and test it before communications were restored with the station. And with that, the flight team reassessed their stations and gave a go for flight. 
The rest is history. The success of the space launch system was a long time coming and was only possible due to the efforts of NASA engineers and technicians. Artemis 1 is a combined effort of not just countries, but people that don't often get the spotlight. These are the people who drive into the explosion radius of a fueled rocket to tighten some bolts. People who rush out to a tracking station to sift through server equipment, trying to find where the signal stops, and of course, the people in the control room checking and rechecking their readouts. Coming at the heels of the spectacular Artemis 1 success, the Japanese government has signed on to provide equipment for NASA's upcoming Lunar Gateway space station project. In a virtual ceremony, Japan's Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, Kaiko Nagaoka, announced her country's intention to continue supporting the International Space Station through 2030 and signed an agreement with NASA which outlined the part Japan would be playing in the creation and operation of the planned Lunar Space Station Gateway. Just like in the previous Gateway Agreement from January 2021, the Japanese space agency JAXA will be providing life support systems, cameras, and thermal controls. They'll also be providing batteries for the ESA's Esprit Refueling Module, NASA's Halo Habitation Module, and the IHAB International Habitation Module. The big change this year comes from the confirmation that JAXA will be developing a version of their HTVX cargo spacecraft to run missions to the Gateway, in return for having a Japanese astronaut hitch a ride on a future Artemis mission to the station. Previously, Japan had only committed to investigating if such modifications would be possible. The HTVX is a planned successor to the current uncrewed H2 transfer vehicle, which is currently being used by JAXA to resupply the ISS. The first flight of Japan's new cargo ship hasn't even launched yet. It's scheduled for launch in January 2024 and is currently designed for runs to the ISS. NASA's agreement says Japan's gateway variant, the HTV-XG, will bring supplies to the lunar station by no later than 2030. Gateway itself is, like the ISS, an international effort, with modules and equipment being provided by several countries. It was never really in doubt that Japan would reaffirm their support, but it's great to see so much support for the Artemis program right after the launch of Artemis 1. Japan's contributions to the Gateway Station are pivotal for keeping the life support working, so they are an important partner to have reaffirmed their support so publicly. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.